What will the rotations look like for Gophers men's basketball? And also, is building from the transfer portal every single year even sustainable? We're jumping into that today. Hey, you no are locked happens, on Golden no Gophers. No matter what we're going to do here, we're just going to keep rowing. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota uh, Golden out, Gophers. Whatever turns out, we're just going to keep rowing. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. We're just going to keep rowing, keep rowing, and keep rowing. Yes, sir. Welcome in. You are listening to Lockdown Golden Gophers, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. My name's Kane Rob, host of the podcast, former collegiate football video coordinator and recruiting assistant, here to talk Golden Gophers with you each and every day of the week, Monday through Friday. But during this offseason, we're going three days a week. It's sporadic, depending on the breaking news and things we have going. But I digress. June, July, a little bit different. But once we hit that August month, boy, oh boy, is it you don't you hit the ground running and you keep on going. We're gonna break down every single Gophers football opponent in depth. We're gonna break down every single position group in this room in depth, and we're just gonna have a heck of a time. So be sure to hit subscribe over on YouTube so you don't miss any of that daily Gophers content. But we'll keep on going with this offseason grind as well through June and July. Now, June's gonna be up today. Tomorrow we hit July. That means one more month of a little bit less shows, and then we hit the ground running because football will be here before you know it. But today we're talking about Gophers men's basketball because we had a latest addition to the team in yesterday with a transfer portal commit in Tyler Cochran. So how could this rotation shape out? We know Ben Johnson has a more shallow rotation than most coaches out there, usually sitting at that six to seven ish players in the rotation. We've even seen six players at a time in the rotation. So what would it look like with all these fresh faces, so many new transfers and and some returning experience, plus a couple high-graded freshmen. How will this thing shake out? We're going to dive into that. Then we're going to move on to, is this continued transfer portal rebuild sustainable for Minnesota? Or what will become of Minnesota if they can't get back on track with some consistent recruiting, but also with player retention? And then finally, we're going to talk about a couple names on the 2025 class to be in the know on when it comes to Gophers basketball. So let's kick it off first with the rotation. What does it look like for Ben Johnson next year? Now, this is still up in the air. It's still a little bit of a guess, but it's almost a brand new roster for Coach Ben Johnson for the third time in four years. And at this point, expecting stability is foolish in the new NIL college landscape, especially for men's basketball. Now, it seems like football, you can find a little bit more sustainability because you're so deep. You have a roster of, what, 85 scholarship players, 100 to 120 kids on the team. So if you lose 10 players, if you lose 15 players, it doesn't feel as impactful or the uh, a, a death blow to your program Because you have stuff building in the background. You have people waiting in the wings. You have depth on the team. And also the players in the portal, there's a ton of players in that front. So filling 10 to 15 for football doesn't seem as much of a task. But when you're going to basketball and you only have 13 scholarships and you lose six, seven, eight players in a given year, that can be absolutely damaging to your team that can take any momentum you've been building any any trajectory upwards and just make it feel like it's completely washed away. So how can coach Ben Johnson come back from that? We're going to talk about that in a little bit here, but I want to talk about what this rotation looks like because this NIL college landscape is just so different. Now on this team, we have four returning players, Dawson Garcia, Mike Mitchell Jr., Parker Fox, and Caden Betts. Now beyond them, we have seven new players coming in from the transfer portal. That's Lukai Patterson, Tyler Cochran, Femi Odekel, uh, Brennan Rigsby, uh, Trey Edmonds, Frank Mitchell and Caleb Williams, seven senior 
transfers. Actually, I believe uh, just one of them isn't a true on full senior in Frank Mitchell, but I digress. It's a lot of players that are only going to be here for possibly one year and one player who might be here for two years. On top of that, you have two incoming freshmen, Isaac Asuma and Grayson Grove, and then you have three total walk-on players with two of them being newer, one of them being in his last year, Lincoln Meister, who tra- transfers in from Duluth, another one who was on the manager side of things for the boys basketball team, now a walk-on for the team, and then Eric Reeder, who also was on the team last year. Now, when it comes to the rotation, I am not expecting that any of the three walk-ons get time. Plain and simple. If they do good for them, it shows that they are busting their tail and finding a way, and they probably won't be walk-ons for much longer after that. But I'm not expecting any playtime for the walk-ons right now. I am also under the assumption that Grayson Grove will redshirt. Now, is Isaac Asuma going to redshirt? I am not sure he is a higher rated recruit and usually, especially in this new landscape, you have to find ways to get them on the court or maybe they hit the transfer portal because they aren't as patient in this day and age. So that's a big question. But overall, Grayson Grove and the three walk-ons, I would say don't really see much time in this upcoming season. So with that, that leaves 12 players with a likely eight player rotation for coach Ben Johnson. Now, why did I pick eight? Because in his three years as a coach, his first season, we saw a majority of six players getting 15 or more minutes per game. Then the next two seasons in 23 and 24, we have seen eight players who saw 15 or more minutes per game in 24. It was eight players for 14 or more minutes a game. Parker Fox averaged 14, but once Josh Ola Joseph lost his minutes and Parker Fox kind of stepped into it, we saw more of a seven to eight man rotation with the Gophers in 24. So you can lock in the three returning players with 14 plus minutes from last year's team into that main rotation. Again, I think all three of them get minutes. I think all three of them either stay at the same level of minutes or increase in minutes. I think Parker Fox could see an increase in minutes easily. And I believe Mike Mitchell Jr. and Dawson Garcia will both start for sure. So that's two starters locked in, in my opinion. Plus, Parker Fox seems to be more effective for this team and what they need from him. Coming off the bench, being a six man, being a spark plug, being an energizer off the bench. So I will call him the six man at that. But moving beyond them and honing in on the other three starters, you can see the need for two wing players as starters and a big. Now, on the big side, it's a little bit easier to narrow down because it likely comes down to Frank Mitchell or Trey Edmonds. And I don't think this one is particularly close. I think Frank Mitchell is going to be the starter because he has multiple years of eligibility and he was a top five rebounder in the country last year. He should be able to fit that Pharrell Payne role to a T, similar size, similar Similar build. I think that he is going to be a starter alongside Dawson Garcia as two of the bigs on this team. Now, on the wings, it gets a little bit more difficult to predict because we don't know how the transfers will translate onto a bigger stage, a higher conference, high major power conference type stage. Now, Caden Betts could find a way to get into the rotation, but seeing as he hasn't found the floor in the past two years, I think that it's going to be a little bit of a stretch to just all of a sudden jump him into the starting lineup. So I think Coach Ben Johnson is going to prioritize the experience from the transfer portal, and I think we can rule him out of the starters. Asuma is another one that uh, he's more of a facilitating guard. I don't think Ben Johnson's going to rush him onto the floor. That said, if he was the best guard from jump, ready to go and ready to start immediately, then you could run him at the one move Mike Mitchell Jr. back over to the two. That being said, I don't see that being the route for the Gophers. I think Betts could find his way into the rotation, but I don't think he'll start away. I think Asuma could find his way into the rotation, but I don't think he will start right away. Now, one thing I am sure of is Ben will prioritize defense first and then offensive fluidity and ball movement with versatility as your next most important things for this system. So overall, I think defense is going to be a huge factor and a huge stressor for Coach Ben Johnson and finding time on this team. Now, I could be completely wrong, but my read here is that Caleb Williams and Brennan Rigsby could find a role with their three-point shooting, but I do not foresee either of these guys being a starter on the regular for the Minnesota Gophers. So maybe if it were to happen, then maybe Rigsby could with his size and his length, but I'm still not there. So I think the three candidates remaining that are the most likely to be in the starting positions 
are Femi Odekel, Lukai Patterson, or Tyler Cochran, the latest addition. I think of those, I think it's a safe bet that Femi Odekel slots in at that three slot for Minnesota. So that leaves you with just finding your other guard slash wing to pair up with Mike Mitchell Jr., Femi Odekel, Dawson Garcia, and Frank Mitchell. Now, there's still a ton of time from now until October to make that decision, but if you had to lock one in right now on that other guard role, if both of them had started at the same point in time in the program and being able to practice at the same time, get the offense down, get a feel for it, then I think I would maybe lean Tyler Cochran because of his defensive prowess. That being said, Luke Patterson has been here working for two weeks with the team, so I think he has a jump on it. I will slot Luke Patterson Patterson into the starter spot for now. And I think Tyler Cochran easily has a rotation spot with the defensive prowess that he brings to this team. So that gives you starters of Mike Mitchell Jr., Lukai Patterson, Femi Odekale, Dawson Garcia, and Frank Mitchell Jr. with a six man of Parker Fox and a rotational guard of Tyler Cochran. Now that's seven players right there. And we talked about a rotation of eight. So those fighting for the last rotational spot would be Isaac Asuma, Caleb Williams, Brennan Rigsby, Trey Edmonds, and Caden Betts. Now, this is where things continue to get complicated in my eyes. I think Edmonds plays as that Jack Wilson or that Trayton Thompson uh, type role where a big who is there for fall trouble purposes or plays uh, when injuries happen, but otherwise he is more of a pending on occasion person. So I think you take him out of the rotation for now. Caleb Williams brings scoring prowess. It's super intriguing with how much he scored against the Gophers in that exhibition, but just how much he scored at the D3 level, but he is coming from the D3 level. And many may assume he is more of an occasional player with a huge leap, but I absolutely could see him garner a larger role, but time will tell. So for right now, I think we'll play it on the safer side. He'll get less than 15 minutes per game, so we won't put him in that key rotation. That leaves you bets and Asuma that I think maybe compliment complicate this matter because being younger players they also have a lot more eligibility left but if you don't find them a role then they could possibly be intrigued by the portal and wanting to look elsewhere so do you try and get those guys time and key minutes throughout the season to make them feel a part of this but also to see the future beyond the senior laden team of the keys are in their hands moving forward so Betts and Asuma, I think, are really, really key players to take on that last rotational spot. And then Brennan Rigsby maybe is more of an occasional player as well. We're going to find out, but who are the final four in your mind? Who do you think are the ones that are going to vie for the key final rotational spot? I want to know your thoughts down in the comments below, or who would you remove from my projections? How is your lineup shakeout? Let me know in the comments below. I appreciate y'all, but let's dive into is this sustainable, this transfer portal rebuild over and over? We're dump, jumping into that coming up next. Now, Gopher fans, if you haven't heard yet, sports are slowing down, and I absolutely hate it. But the football season will be here in the blink of an eye. But it doesn't matter when season it is, what sports are going on. FanDuel has you covered. I love sports, you love sports, and we never want to stop, but FanDuel is giving you the opportunity to make sure that sports keep going whenever you want. All you have to do is open up the app and dream up bets for any sport, anytime you are in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all com customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. So there's something for everyone every single day, all summer long. Sounds like a deal to me. It should sound like a deal to you as well. I think I'm ready to drop my prediction of getting the Celtics back to back championships. It hasn't been done since the Warriors, but I think now's the time. Now, I know a lot of Timberwolves fans aren't going to want to hear that, but regardless, if you think it's a Timberwolves shot, now's the time you can get in on the early money, the better, the better odds right now before they change and shift towards a Timberwolves winning or what have you. So all summer long, take advantage of their boost or their bonus daily over at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn and make the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sportsbook betting partner of the MLB and of Locked On. All right, Gophers fans, how sustainable is the transfer portal rebuild every single year? I feel like the obvious answer would be like, you, you can't live that way. You can't do it that way. But it also feels like the Gophers have been unintentionally doing it for three out of the last four years now because players keep leaving, players keep taking now NIL offers and other opportunities. And it just feels like 
Ben Johnson and crew aren't being dealt a fair share, but at the same time, you have to live with what you're dealt. And so right now we've seen the Gophers struggle year after year and seen a lot of ups and downs in these last three years. But Ben Johnson has been finding some gems in the transfer portal as well. You talk about names like Jamison Battle, Talon Cooper, Peyton Willis, Dawson Garcia, Elijah Hawkins, Mike Mitchell Jr., Parker Fox, Luke Lowy, EJ Stevens. All these players, I would say those nine players have found fairly consistent levels of success in their time in Minnesota. Now, some misses have been Jack Wilson, Taurus Samuels, Charlie Daniels, and Chris Kynes. But even then, I don't believe that the intention was for Jack Wilson or Chris Kynes to really play minutes for the Gophers in that season that they were here. So it's hard to count that against them. But even if you keep those two in the numbers of those 13 players I just listed, that would be a 70% hit rate with nine out of the 13 hitting. That's a pretty dang good hit rate, especially when you talk about these players weren't just guys that were all about eight points per game, give you 20 minutes. And that's that. No, we had guys that were we had Dawson Garcia, who was an all Big Ten level player. We had three players that got garnered honorable mention for all Big Ten players in Jamison Battle, uh, Peyton Willis, and Elijah Hawkins. Now, I think Battle and Hawkins both could have made a case to be at least third team, and I was baffled that Hawkins wasn't being the assist leader in the entire nation at the time. But I digress. When you're looking at the types of transfer success Ben Johnson has found, it has been fairly impressive. Elijah Hawkins set the program record for assists. Jamison Battle literally was like almost single-handedly carrying the scoring load with Peyton Willis when it came to Ben Johnson's first year here on the job. And then you've got Dawson Garcia, who went from an honorable mention in the conference to an all Big Ten second team. And there were some out there that said he could have been an all Big Ten first team. Maybe he puts it together and gets it this year. But we're going to see probably some gems and some success from this year's class as well, like a Femi Odekale or a Tyler Cochran. Who knows? Maybe Caleb Williams comes up and shows he should have been playing D1 ball for years now. But overall, with a 70% hit rate thus far, if you were to say we hit on 70% again of the seven transfers we come in, that means about five of those transfers hit, and that would be major for the Gophers moving forward. So if he can continue to really show he, he can find those right fits for his system, find the right guys for the culture and what have you, then it is something that it looks like we can continue to build upon. But that being said, rebuilding every year also has some massive downsides. Lack of chemistry, not knowing until they're actually here on campus and playing the games. You can look great in practice. You can look great when you're in, in the summer sessions and what have you, but you won't really know until you hit that non-conference schedule. And all of a sudden, if things aren't clicking, it can go bad in a hurry. Now, on top of that, reteaching the same system and the concepts as opposed to building on to concepts and finding more advanced ways within your system and in offense and what have you to attack in different manners. No, you can't get into the nitty gritty finer details and keep building upon it and adding upon it because you have to keep on reteaching it because half or more of your team doesn't know the current system and is still getting into the flow, getting the understanding and building the instinctive play and the instinctive reactions and how things work and being able to play versatile, uh, more versatile and play the two, the three and the four. And it doesn't matter depending on who's on the floor, you can be versatile with where you run a certain offense. They can't get into that nitty gritty if they keep on having to reteach the whole thing every single season. Now, on top of that, outside of the basketball court, reestablishing a culture every season. If you don't have a heartbeat guy, if you don't have that leader that sticks around, it's hard to really keep that culture going that you might have built and found success in in one year. On top of that, fewer the fewer turners that you've had, the more you have struggled to win consistently. And not knowing how a player's game might consistently translate to a power conference coming from a lower conference. All of these are risks when you are rebuilding every single year from the transfer portal. On top of a lack of tradition. On top of a lack of longevity built up. On top of a lack of player-athlete perspectives 
from the current players to recruits. How can you bring in a recruit if you don't have a guy like Dawson Garcia or Parker Fox who's been along for the ride of three to four years? If you have a guy who's been here for a year or a summer and you're trying to recruit and have them visit and have them have a host who's only been with the program for a couple months, that's not going to serve you well. So although we might be finding hits in the transfer portal, I do not think continuously restocking six seven players every single year is going to be beneficial for this program or for Ben Johnson's longevity, no matter if it's fair or not. So we have to find a way to get some player retention, whether it's finding a way to super advance our NIL or whether it's finding a way for players to give us an extra year to get that pool built up to them for, to get that NIL going, to get them uh, more playing time or what have you having the vision there and being able to sell it realistically. And if then you realistically, hold and maintain those promises that will go a long way with future recruits having seen you kept your word for those other guys who stuck around so it's going to be really tough i don't think you can keep on rebuilding you have to find a way to generate some sustainability and some retention now in the end if minnesota can't find a way to get some retention i think minnesota could be in big trouble for the future because when you can have a program record setter plucked away like nothing, or you can have a homegrown invested big man who didn't have all the recruiting after his way. And then he walks away for some cash, or you have a leader and a focus of the team leave for an in-conference rival. All of those things have happened to the Gophers in the past three years, and that will devastate a program if it continues to happen. And then you turn into more of a feeder program, which would be tragic for Minnesota. In the end, I trust Ben Johnson's eye for the portal. He has proven to find some great fits and some great gems and what and it translates. And what he has proven, it's impressive. But if you if winning is the focus and the goal, if the NCAA tournament is the goal, if if you want to be in the top tier or the top half of the Big Ten is your goal, then needing to fill half of your scholarships via the portal every year is not going to be sustainable. So hopefully Ben Johnson and crew can turn this thing into a more retention, more retention for the basketball program. But the final thing we're going to talk about is the recruits for next year's class. We don't have anyone committed yet, but who are the key players on Minnesota's priority list? And is it realistic? We're diving into that coming up next. All right, Gophers basketball fans, we are wrapping this one up with names to watch for Gophers basketball recruiting in 2025. Now, there's four names that Minnesota has put at the top of the priority list from what I can tell. Now, Tommy Oneman is from North Dakota. He was the number one player in the state of North Dakota, but he's officially transferring to Creighton Durham Hall, which puts him right in the Gophers backyard. Literally, he will be in downtown Minneapolis, which isn't too far from Dinkytown. So, Minnesota can hopefully put the full arm blitz and keep him because he is now the number one ranked kid in the state of Minnesota, even though he is transferring over from North Dakota. He is a big man, six foot 10. He can play the four or the five. He seems like he is seriously considering Minnesota along with Nebraska. He just got a Wisconsin offer and that seems to be on the table as well. So, it's a big race, especially here in the Midwest. He is seen as the number eight center in the country and the number 46 recruit in the country by on three. And if you want to flip it over to 247, he's the number 18 center and the number 141 player in the class of 247. So he is a four star guy. He is a huge talent. He is a great big that can play Big Ten basketball. And oh, he is officially visiting in August. So hopefully, Minnesota can keep this one uh, at top of mind for him because I think he might be the number one player on the Gophers recruiting priorities and I hope they roll out the red carpet and get him to stay in Minnesota. Now another player heavily at the top of the list for the Gophers is Amari Allen. We've talked about him on the show. Allen is a top 75 prospect from IMG Academy. He's a six foot six guard. I believe he is initially from Wisconsin, but he ended up going to IMG. He has offers from Arizona State, Auburn, Creighton, uh, Florida State, Indiana, Iowa, Marquette, TCU, Tennessee, Villanova, and Charleston College. Now, why do I bring up Charleston College? Well, he has a, a close relationship with the coach there, I believe. I can't remember the exact tie, but I wouldn't rule them out. It seems like they are seriously in contention for him. Now, he has a very similar skill set to Cam Christie. He's a playmaker, but he has a very nice shot-making ability. And he took notice of how Minnesota used Cam Christie, and hopefully that could play into their favor. Now, Cam Christie fell a little bit into the draft than what we would like to would have liked to see, especially because we saw thought 
and saw rumors of potentially a late first round, early second round, ended up the 46 pick. But that being said, he was still drafted. It shows you you can come to the Gophers and still be an NBA player after a freshman season. Now, he is ranked as the number 21 small forward in the class and number 106 player in the class overall by 247. And if you're looking at on three, he's the 16th small forward in the class and the number 69 player in the class. He is officially visiting in August. And again, him and Tommy seem to be the top two players priority players for Minnesota on their board. Now, two other players that are still very high in consideration for Minnesota, making a huge push for him. Kai Rogers from the Milwaukee area, four-star center. He has 18 offers and many of them, including high major schools, Florida State, Illinois, Iowa, Iowa State, Marquette, Indiana, Penn State, Ole Miss, TCU, Texas, Wisconsin, West Virginia, a whole bunch of interest for Kai Rogers. Now he's the number 14 center in the class, 116th player over all by 247 but if you look at on three he is the number four center and the number 37 player in the class i think kai rogers is immensely talented i it shows when a texas is after him and a and a, a wisconsin and a west virginia and a marquette and an indiana and a florida state it's all over the country you don't see too many uh programs go all across the country it's usually more regionally based so maybe a big 10 base and an acc base and those are kind of the two programs or two conferences attacking certain recruits when you see recruits coming from every which program you know that there is a heavy interest and a heavy upside in that player it's hard to say where minnesota is in this race but of the four players i am mentioning today i believe this one is the longest shot by far and then the final player i want to bring up is barrett lower from rhode island uh rhode island area prospects a uh, small forward player. He really has most of his offers coming from the East Coast. The high major offers he has is Penn State, Minnesota, Wake Forest, and Xavier from more of those power conferences. But he's visited Mike Minnesota and he will likely visit again. He is more of an under recruited player right now. He has heard a little bit from Creighton as well. So his recruiting could pick up, but hopefully Minnesota is still in the conversation and hopefully building on that relationship. And he hears the most from Minnesota, Penn State and Notre Dame, who also hasn't offered yet, but is in conversations with him. So Barrett Lohr, a player to keep an eye on, along with Amari Allen and Tommy Oneman, and then Kai Rogers is someone the Gophers have pushed for, but I'm not sure if that one is going to be as successful. I hope you enjoyed this quick little recruiting tidbits on the class of 2025 and more. We're going to dive into football on a late night show tonight to have it first thing ready for you on July 1st tomorrow as well. So if you want to listen to it late night, be ready to tap in around 10 or 11 o'clock, but otherwise, you can catch it first thing in the morning. That's going to do it for us here at Locked On Golden Gophers. I'll see you tomorrow. Row the boat, Sky Yuma, go Gophers as always, and don't forget to hit subscribe.